Hey, let's welcome everybody watching in this service. Can we do that? People are watching from everywhere this morning. We got so much to be thankful for. Last service, we had 17 states and four countries in the last service. One family watching from India. I don't know if I've seen that before, which is pretty awesome. If you are a teacher, you work in the school system, uh, you're a coach, you're a school administrator, I want you to stand to your feet and we are going to honor you. If you can do that, would you stand up and be honored? Remain standing for a minute. I want to talk to you guys. Uh, we got you a gift. We come bearing gifts today. We tried to figure out what best to give you, and we got you a $25 Amazon gift card. So um, I think that would be the gift of a bath bomb. So, so some of you are like, no, that's not for me. Uh, we didn't know what to get you, just something that we wanted to say thank you. Listen, you've had a hard year. It's been a difficult year. You as teachers have been asked to do things that you're not equipped to do. I mean, we're equipped to talk to people all over the place. We as a church have honed our, uh, our skills for years, but y'all this year found yourself with a laptop open with a camera trying to talk to students online and students in person, and it's been difficult. You've had to deal with a fear of a virus. Uh, you know, in, in crazy, crazy times, you don't get paid nearly what you deserve. You are unsung heroes. Most of you don't know this, but my family pedigree is in education. My mom and dad, my dad was a school teacher for years. My mom was a librarian years ago. My sister's a principal. My niece is in the room as a teacher. I really do believe if I wasn't in ministry, I would be a teacher because you can really affect people's lives. So thank you for what you do. You are truly unsung heroes. And I'll say this, next year as you jump back into school and you walk into a classroom and you're like, man, we need some equipment. We need this. We need some supplies. Never hesitate to ask the church because we are equipped and prepared and want to step up beside you and make the biggest difference we can because our kids are not, you know, they're not the community of tomorrow. They're the community of today. And you, you live in a day. Listen, you, you deal, in a day, deal with teaching in a day that honor has left the building. What I mean by that is years ago, um, if I did something wrong, I couldn't go home and tell my dad, boy, my teacher did this to me. Because a lot of you, you deal with that. All of a sudden, you get a call from a parent. The parent's all over you because little Johnny or Susie couldn't do anything wrong. And I can imagine me going home and saying, Dad, my teacher did. My dad would have spanked me right away before we had even got back to school. <laughs> but you, we live in a weird time. And so you guys, you matter to, to me. You matter to us as a church. And we just wanted to stop and thank you. Especially this year, we will do it every year for sure because you truly are unsung heroes of our community. But we love you. Everybody seated, you really need to give it up for these men and women standing. Good stuff. I like that. It's pretty awesome. Let's talk about last week for a minute. It was Mother's Day. What a great week. Uh, I'd ask you to uh, go into uh, an offering. Make it count offering. We talked that, about that at the beginning of 2021, and I want to talk to you about it for a minute, just to let you know where we stand. Last week, I asked you to, uh, we had a goal in mind, to bring above our tithes and offerings, our goal was $250,000 in one week. We weren't going to go into a capital campaign giving above our tithes and offerings for weeks or months. I wasn't asking you to second mortgage your house or anything like that. What could we do as a church just to bring in a one-time gift, all of us together, and, and to make it count. Basically saying that 2008 to 2020 is not the best days of our church. Our church went through an unexplainable 12-year window there. But what about the next 12 years? I believe the greatest days of our church are ahead of it. And I believe coming out of this last season, we needed to make a stand and show the community Hey, you know what? We mean business that we will expand. Great days will come. And so we took an offering to expand our teen center. What we are going to do down there is we've got the second warehouse. We're going from 11,000 square feet to 22,000, 24,000 square feet. And we're just basically 
expanding that because we need it. We have over 500 check-ins a week of teenagers. Yep, there you go. Parents, if you could do me a favor, we have a quiet room. I want us to lock in for about 30 minutes, so make that happen. Use that quiet room if at all possible. Let's not be distractions if we can. Uh, I want us to see our teen center expand. We need to do it. We need to do it. We have 500 check-ins a week. We have lots of kids that use it. I have parents today that tell me, I don't know what I would do without the teen center. A free a free space for the community, teens to come each and every day. So thank you for that. So here's what we know. $250,000 will pay for that project. I ask you to bring a, the best offering that you could bring. Um, somebody asked me this week in the community, they, they walked up to me at Walmart and they said, Brent, did I, did I hear right that you asked the church to go into a $250,000 uh, offering in one week? What are you smoking? That was his exact words. And I said, listen, we're going to take a stand here and we're going to see if, you know what, if we can honor God by marrying our vision with our teen ministry. And so I want to show you what you actually gave last week in a one-time offering, which is pretty unbelievable. Good. Good. It is mind-blowing to believe that we as a church, there were large checks, small checks, middle-sized checks, but we as a church do it together. Many hands make light work, and we all brought our best, not equal giving, but equal sacrifice, and we, we stepped up. By the way, that number has since risen by over $20,000, so the real number is four hundred and thirty-three dollars or $43,000. It's really approaching $450,000 when it's all said and done. To God be the glory. God is the resource. We are the conduits. We don't have any building named after one particular person. You know why? Because all of us do it together. God gets the credit. Guys, I am so thankful. I am honored that you would do that. Now, some of you mathematicians, you teachers will be proud of me. Let's do a little math. Let's do a little subtraction because some of you are thinking this. Wait a minute. The, the goal was 250000 The offering was 413000 Judging by my math, there's a surplus of 163,000 inquiring minds want to know, what are we doing with that surplus? Could it be that preacher gets a Bentley? <laughs> Here's what we're going to do. We as an elders have been meeting for a couple of months, and we believe that there is another big step of faith. And I'm not even sure what that is quite yet. All I know is we have five identical services a week. We have squeezed every square inch of space in this 4.4 acres. We have parking issues. Uh, Chris Fraley will tell you. We, have, uh, we had six, almost 650 people in the last service. Last week we had 700 in that service. Uh, we are doing the best we can multiplying our space. But we know this by community leaders that this community is going to grow 50,000 people, they're saying now, uh, in the next 5 to 10 years, from 100 to 150,000 people. Lots of people will be moving here, to which a lot of you are like, please don't. I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> but how many of us moved here at one time in our lives? Would you raise your hand high? You're not native Severe Countyans. Look around. Well, they're all searching the promised land like we did. And it is a great, great part of the world to live in, and this church is unexplainable. We have so many people that are moving here that are a part of our online campus. I got to hug a lady, um, Nisi from California, who moved here a few weeks ago, and she was, it's been here for a couple of weeks. So we know that we're going to have growth issues. We don't know what that looks like, but I, w I have been praying, and the elders have been meeting, and I'm like, listen, God... Uh, if, if you feel like it's time for us to maybe take another step of faith in the next few years, show us somehow, some way. He did. You guys did. We're going to take every penny of that money and what comes in, and we're going to set it aside. And we're going to say, God, when you say go, we will go. This is our initial step of faith. We as a church have seen it, that God has taken what we have given and multiplied it 10 times over. And we don't know what that looks like. I honestly don't but we know that we can't sit still. You're growing or dying. I love it that the Teen Center Project is paid for. We will buy, by the way, one gently used new, new to us shuttle. Some of you have seen the new shuttle that's wrapped with the 747. Two of our shuttles are kind of held together with duct tape and chewing gum. 
And we do shuttle from South Oil to New Center. We shuttle students to the Teen Center every single day. And so we probably will buy one more shuttle for the use of our teen ministry and our church ministry as well. But other than that, we're going to put that money aside and say, God, we're going to keep building on that. And when you say go, we're going to go. And I don't know what that looks like quite yet. But when I know, you'll know because we will do it together. And just know we're not afraid to take another step of faith. We're not. And I believe that the best days of this church are ahead of it and not behind it. And you guys showed it again last week. God gets the credit. I think we should give God a huge applause for what, man, that's pretty awesome, I think. So, that's about all I got for you today. It was a great service. I love, we can head to Applebee's. I want to talk to you for a few minutes, not long. Message will be short. I want to talk to you about honor because I am on a mission. We live in an honor an honorless world. I don't even think people know what honor looks like anymore or what it even means. Wednesday night, we had some eighth graders in the, in the green room. And before we stepped out here to honor our eighth graders, I asked three of them, what's honor mean? One of them immediately said this, thought it was very inquisitive for an eighth grader. Uh, when I think of honor, I think of the Chinese culture because they seem to honor their elders. They seem to honor their community. They seem to put themselves, uh, up, you know, below the community. And you think, well, you know, communism and Chinese and things like that, but yet just the respect that they would show to community and how they would be a part of the community. That's interesting from an eighth grader. Another eighth grader said medals, the, the Congressional Medal of Honor, Purple Heart. Think of that in a military setting. Someone would really give up their own lives. And another little girl standing in between these two boys that had these pretty awesome statements, she simply looked at me and she said, Pastor, I don't know. I'm not really taught what honor is. I don't even know. You know, our world tries to honor. We honor people that can throw a, a baseball hard or uh, catch a football or sports. Or we, 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 uh, I think of Peyton Manning and Neyland Stadium and the Ring of Honor. I think of all these different ways we try to honor great men and women of, who do some noble cause. But what about everyday ordinary people? Are we people that show honor? Do we even know what honor means? Can we identify honor? So I'm going to open with an illustration, and I'm going to take a chance here. I'm going to see if you remember this individual. You might, I think you might, played basketball a while ago. I'm going to show my age here. But there was a guy who played basketball, and he was a pretty good basketball player, so I think you'll remember his name. His name was Michael Jordan. I think you'll remember who he was. Yeah. Anybody remember Michael Jordan? Raise your hand. Huh? Arguably the greatest basketball player to ever live. I would say absolutely the greatest basketball player to ever live. He was interviewed recently, and somebody said, Michael, do you think you and Larry and Magic and all the guys of days gone by, could you beat LeBron and all of these guys today? And, and Michael said, I don't think so. We would probably lose by five or ten points. And the guy's like, really? You think they're that much better? He goes, well, we're like over 50 now. So it's pretty, it'd be tough. I thought, anyway, that came out, that, that's pretty good right there. In 2009, Michael Jordan was introduced into the basketball. He was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame, the NBA Hall of Fame. I love Michael Jordan because he was a North Carolina Tar Heel. I grew up being a North Carolina Tar Heel. Michael Jordan grew up in Wilmington. My dad watched him play in high school. Uh, I, just a lot of connection. When he was with the Bulls, must-see TV. I mean, my family was so weird. We were on vacation one time back with a TV with an antenna. We were driving along an interstate. We couldn't get the uh, finals of the Bulls game. It was on like CBS or whatever. We pull into a rest stop, try to adjust the antenna, and watch the end of the Bulls winning uh, another title. Even my mom and my wife were all like, we were Michael Jordan fans. Well, in 2009, he stood up to be inducted in the Hall of Fame, and he spent 23 minutes basically saying this, I'm Michael Jordan. I'm awesome. And he was worthy of that. He basically said he looked at like Byron Russell. Some of you remember the Utah Jazz. You remember when I retired? You remember and you told me like, man, I can't believe you retired. I wanted to beat you down. The next time I ever see you in a pair of shorts, we'll, we'll get it on. And, and Michael came back. You remember that? And they played Utah and they were standing around the circle of basketball court right there in the finals of the NBA. And Michael goes, hey, I got shorts on. You ready to roll? And he would spend 23 minutes telling people, thank you for fueling my fire to make me who I am. I'm Michael Jordan. 
And it was great. Awesome. I love, I still watch that from time to time. It's hard to believe it was that many years ago, but some of you don't remember this. Others were inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame that year as well, one of which was a man named David Robinson. David Robinson will come on the screen. He was a power forward. He played for the United States Naval Academy. He played his entire career for the San Antonio Spurs. Jay, um, who sang a while ago, talk about symmetry, he heard this illustration last night, so he throws, throws on his David Robinson jersey to sing. I thought that was pretty awesome. But after Michael Jordan spent 23 minutes kind of saying, hey, I'm Michael Jordan, which it was, he was worthy to do that. It was his moment. David Robinson steps up to be inducted into basketball's highest honor. He started talking about his three sons. He named them individually, told them how special they were and their uniqueness to the world. He talked about his wife, how she was the rock, how loving she was. He would go on to talk about people like George Gervin, the original Mr. San Antonio Spur. He would talk about several other people. He would just say, man, you are incredible. And he would come to a man named Tim Duncan, who, by the way, ironically, was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. Last night, David Robinson stood there to introduce Tim Duncan. And David Robinson, who played 13 years for the San Antonio Spurs, averaged 21 points a game, was an unbelievable power forward, played for the dream team, would stand up at his moment and look at Tim Duncan and say, Tim Duncan, you were the greatest power forward to ever play the game. David Robinson is a born-again Christian. David Robinson showed the world that night what honor looks like. He had every opportunity to say, look at me. Look at what I've done. But he started with his family, went into his wife, people that meant a lot to him, even teammates, and said, you guys are the heroes, not me. That's honor. Long before David Robinson stood to be inducted in the Hall of Fame, the Apostle Paul would write a letter from the city of Corinth, and he would encourage Christians living in Rome. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I'm going to land there for just a few minutes, unpack a few things. Paul is getting older. He's aged. He's learned a lot. He's experienced in a lot of things. And he's going to tell us in Romans chapter 12, man, many great truths that we still need to know today. He's going to discuss that we are living sacrifices. That's our spiritual act of worship. Basically, that you know what, we're the only Jesus that some people are going to ever see. He's going to talk about don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Don't be like everybody else the way they live. You have to renew your mind, he's going to say over and over. It's the renewing of your mind in God's word and through Christ. He's going to talk about searching out God's will for our lives. And right in the middle, he talks about a five-letter word that people don't understand and even Christians don't get, and that's the word honor. So let's read it together. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Here we go. Ready? Wonder why this would make the cut. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. You're like, Brent, there's no way I can live that out. If we become less and Christ becomes greater... Honor one another above yourselves. 
We live in a very meistic world. A lot of self-tout. A lot of look at me. I think of Facebook. I think of my friend this morning who was jumping on from the Dominican Republic down there. And he's like, he sent me a picture this morning with his toes in the sand. And he goes, by the way, I'll be watching the service right here. I love us when we put that on Facebook. We're at the beach. What does that say? Look at me. I'm here and you're not. It's easy to put our own kids, to tout our own kids. I put that up this week. My son made all district and baseball team. And, man, I want to make sure to honor other kids. And But as a proud dad, our default is like, look at my kid. Look at what I did as a parent, right? I mean, it's easy to do. I mean, if not... Our DNA, our sin DNA, and our culture sweeps us downstream, and that's who we are. Look at us, and Apostle Paul says, hey, if you want to get it right, you honor people above yourself. You're never more like God than when you give, you live, you laugh, you love, and let's throw one more on top here, you honor. Honor. Where is the honor in our world? I think of that question often. We live in a culture without honor. We devalue people um, by dishonoring them. Husbands devalue wives d- d- by the way you talk to them. Wives, you devalue your husbands. Children, man, we devalue parents. Parents, you devalue your kids. Honor is taught. We treat Honor as if it, man, has left the building. My son, I will go back to him for a minute. I try to teach him this. I ask people around him often, does he do this? Because I want him to do this because I think it's a sign of honor. When you talk to someone older than you, you say, yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. You look them in the eye. I used to say you shake your hand, but we don't do that anymore. And our society now is telling us to go away from that. We fist bump. But some people will say, well, Brent, man, that's just a Southern thing. No, that's an awesome thing is to honor. I still say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And you're like, Brent, you're 51 years old almost. It's a sign of honor. It was taught within me. See, we've confused this. Christians today, the culture today, we have totally screwed up the meaning of honor. We consider it respect. Respect is different than honor. Respect is earned. Yes, I need to earn your respect. You earn my respect. But honor, biblical honor, is freely given. We honor because what? God created us all in his image. We are extraordinary. We are not just ordinary. So what is honor? It's hard to define. If you want to define it, I preached on it before, and I'm like on a mission about this. Honor is to value. It's worth. It's weight. It means to put value to something. It's precious. It's, I mean, it's, it's weighty. The Old Testament, the word honor is the form of the word kabod. That means heavy or weighty. It suggests something important. Honor is like a guide. A guide gets us to where we want to be. If you put honor in a relationship, it will guide you to that kind of relationship that you want to have. Somebody said this, and I think this is the most powerful thing to think about this week. Ready? Honor is the most important ingredient in any family relationship. As husbands and wives honor each other, they can have a marriage that moves toward oneness and intimacy. When parents honor their children, their kids will know that they're accepted, they're unique, they're secure. When children honor their parents, the family will be healthy as kids learn to grow in an environment of love. The English Standard Version of Romans 12 says this, Honor one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo to do something with eagerness, to take the lead. How about this? As Christians, we are to outdo one another or take the lead in honoring others, putting value on others, considering others precious. A destroyer of honor is putting your needs, your wants, and your cares above everybody else. Philippians 2 says this to me, 2, 3, tells me and you, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. We don't even know how to define dishonor. We think dishonor is out and out disrespect. Jeff Mount, my friend, was in the first service. I'll never forget talking to his brother, Jimmy Mount, who was in Walmart a few years ago. And he, he, he rounded the corner with his buggy, and they ran into another buggy with a 12-year-old and a mom. And Jimmy said, excuse me. And the 12-year-old just simply looked at him and flicked him the, the double bird. 
The mom is standing right there. Jimmy says, I was dumbfounded. I'm like, what is this mom going to do? And the mom basically agreed with the 12-year-old, told Jimmy where to go, and they all moved on together. We think that is, wow, that is dis. If I flicked an adult, a bird with my dad standing there, I would disappear never to be seen again. We think that is like, that's dishonor. No, dishonor is just going through the motions. Dishonor is to really treat something or someone as common or ordinary. Dishonor is marriage going through the motions, not working at it on a day-to-day basis. People dishonor church by treating it as optional. I'll come when I need to or want to, but we have other priorities. In fact, the Greek word for without honor literally means no value. We t- uh, hey, my kid plays baseball. He played travel ball forever. But we teach our kids a lot, parents, when we make sure they never miss a practice and never miss a travel ball date, but church is optional. You're teaching them that, hey, that sport has more value than church and God's word. You're like, that's not true. Absolutely, it's true. I've been there. I know the pressures. So here we go. Ready? Um, remember this about honor. And I'm on a mission. And I, again, I'm not, I don't want to make anybody feel bad. Yesterday and last night, we can do about something today into tomorrow. And we got to as a society. I mean, it's left the building now. So what do we got to remember about honor? Number one, the level of honor you give is determined by the amount of value you perceive. I mean, how much you give it, that's how much you feel like that's valuable. When you value something, you are able to see the extraordinary through the ordinary. When you and I honor someone or something, that's what we protect. We praise it. We prioritize it. Why is it that we're a culture without honor? Because we dishonor God. All true honor is really led from a life that's surrendered to Christ. Prioritizing spiritual matters what matters the most. We're a culture without honor because we're dishonoring God. All true honor is born out of a heart that has surrendered to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. The problem is we treat God so common and so ordinary. Two, the level of value you receive is determined by the amount of honor you give. People don't get it. You, it's not about getting, it's about giving. If you really want your life to count, you want to find what you're looking for, the level of value you receive is determined by the amount of honor that you give. Sometimes at church, go back to it, the preacher likes to meddle, right? I mean, we just don't put the time in. We don't, we don't. We show up. We're not ready. We're not ready and expecting God to move in our lives. Our hearts are not softened. We haven't been prayed up and ready to go. We forgot that God's word every day is our daily bread. This service is the cream on the mocha. This is the celebration. This grounds us. It gives us a point to launch us into this next week, growing spiritually. But every single day matters. And when a family's running late to church and we're arguing in the parking lot, we walk in the door. We've got all these plans after church. We show up here, and then all of sudden I see you in the community or get an email a couple of months um, later and they go, well, Brent, we're not coming to Pathways anymore. I'm just not getting a lot out of the sermons. But yet I get 40 emails of the same sermon of like, oh my Lord, I got so much out of it. I'm growing spiritually. I can't, can't believe how much my family's growing. I get confused. Then I start to think, wait a minute, you actually get out of something what you put into something. And there was a democratic president, by the way, who did say one time in our society, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. People forget that it's about giving And you got to give that value in order to receive what you're looking for. You're like, Brent, you are meddling. Move on. The last one is this. Honor is about what you decide, not not about what they deserve. That's important because then we can confuse respect and honor. Honor is what you decide, not what they deserve. Biblical honor is weight, it's value, and it's given freely. We honor, we, we honor others really one of two ways. We have ulterior motives. We honor our bosses so they can reward us. We honor people in power so they can use their power for us and not against us. We honor the wealthy because they can help our cause. But God's way of honor is love. We honor people because God created them in his image because they are a unique contribution to our world. I like how my life application Bible says this to me. 
Does God's way of honoring others, does it sound too difficult for your competitive nature? I'm a very competitive individual. If I don't watch it, I will look out for like, ah. So some of you know my friend Dan Seaborn. Dan and I talked about this this last week. It's interesting to think about that Dan knows David Robinson, the basketball player. One time Dan was at an NBA game. Dan's a big NBA guy. And years ago when David Robinson was playing, Dan was sitting in the stands and he watched how David Robinson treated the referees, how he treated other players, how he treated other, the people in the stands. And Dan made his way, found him. If you know Dan, he'll figure out how to do this. He found David Robinson and he said, man, let me tell you what, you not only talk the talk, but you walk the walk. I sat and watched you treat everybody around you with honor. You really showed your relationship with Jesus Christ in a basketball game tonight. I'm going to ask you this because all of us don't play basketball. A lot of us are just ordinary. We do our jobs. We are a great part of our community. But if you treat other people, if I was to watch how you treated coworkers, your family, the people around you, could I say you really showed your relationship with Jesus Christ by how you honored the people around you this week? Honor others above yourself. I need it. You need it. Our community needs us as followers of Christ to outdo each other with honor. Show honor. You're like, well, I'll honor if they're honorable. That's respect. Honor is freely given. For those of us that are younger, we honor those of us that are older. Students, honor your teachers. Well, I'll honor them if they Listen, honor them. We should honor next week. We'll honor our firefighters and our police force and our medical professionals. We will honor those men and women because they serve and protect and they deserve a moment to be honored in a community that has lost honor. A couple of weeks, we'll, we'll remember Memorial Day. While all of us think that's the kickoff of summer with hamburgers and hot dogs, we will remember those and honor those who paid the ultimate sacrifice that we might be free and stand here and, and speak the truth in God's word. God's word is powerfully true, but it's not the hearing of it, it's the doing of it that makes a difference. The apostle Paul says to a bunch of Christians in Rome who were struggling in a culture that did not really love them, like a lot of our culture does not love us as Christians, hey, honor one another above yourselves. It makes the difference. So I'll close with this. I was a child of the 70s and a teen of the 80s. I remember this little chorus. Somehow I got stuck on this little chorus a few weeks ago and I started to think about this song and I researched it. I was dumbfounded to find out the meaning behind it and just how this song transpired. A guy, his name was Bob Kilpatrick. He wrote about 30 praise songs back in the late 70s. One song in particular he wrote and he said this, it wasn't for public use. It was supposed to never be heard by anybody but me and my wife. I wrote this little chorus that my wife and I could wake up every morning and we could sing it to each other before we got out of bed. Some of you couples are like, I ain't doing that. And he said we would sing it at night before we would go to bed. And he goes, this was our song to honor our marriage. And it never, I never wanted it to go beyond our bedroom. But you know how it goes, guys. The wife wins out. She said, honey, after a couple of months of singing it, you got to sing this song in church. He was a worship leader at his church. And she goes, you got to sing this. Man, people need to hear this song. It's so simple. It's perfect. People will get it. And so he went to his church. He sang it that Sunday, and the rest is history. So for me in my life, with my wife, with my children, with you guys, which is how I try to treat people and just look at the world in which we live and try to, to live a life of honor, to honor people around me that maybe I don't even know, but I might be the only Jesus that they see. I thought about this, man, this song is perfect. How do we, how do we apply this message? Maybe with this little chorus that was written a long time ago that was never meant to leave the bedroom, but it sure changed the church in the late 70s, early 80s. Maybe if we put this into our lifestyles, things can change. We can be men and women of honor, and boy, we can shine a light into a very dark place. You're like, Brent, what's this song? Some of you will remember this. Some of you won't. In my life, Lord, be glorified. 
be glorified in my life. Lord, be glorified today. That was the song. He wrote it for his wife. They would sing it to each other. They didn't even really need instruments. He sang it in church, and boy, it swept across America. It swept across the Christian nation. How many people grew up and remember that song? You would sing it over and over. We would go in my life and in my heart and in my home and in my church and on Dolly Parton Parkway. And I, I mean, we'd sing it over and over and over. And it faded away from church life. But maybe it needs to become new again. What if we, husbands and wives, what if you wake up tomorrow and you don't have to sing it to her. She'll think you've gone crazy. But what about in your heart and mind? You go, hey, God, in my life, I want you to be glorified today. Can't do anything about yesterday. I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. What about in my life? What if you were glorified today? That is a prayer that we can pray. And boy, what a prayer. What a difference it would make.